As you're settling into your seat, um, would you go ahead and grab your Bibles? Go to Matthew 23. Matthew chapter 23 is where we're going to spend pretty much all of our time together with the remaining bit that we have left. And and uh, if you're new here, welcome. Uh, my name is Matt. I get to be one of the pastors here, and we're grateful that you're here. We're grateful for those who are watching online. And today we are in a part five, in part five, yeah, of our, this series that we do every year that we call Live Love. And if you're new to our church, um, every one of these series, almost every series we do, ends up looking a lot different than we thought it would. We plan, we prepare, our team is super intentional about how we walk into weekends and prepare for Sundays, and then God says, Whoop, we're going to go a different direction. And this series, above all of those, it seems to be that way this year. Because as, I, as I've told you before, for a few months, I had this idea, this roadmap that I thought we needed to take as we were doing Live Love. And it's like every week, God just kind of said, no, like we need, we need to go into a different direction. We need to go into a new direction. And it started week one, where we just talked about the gospel. And if you haven't listened to that message, please go back and listen to that message because it, it might be the most important message I've ever preached from any platform. Because as the church, our mission is to carry the gospel into the world. We cannot carry what we do not know. We cannot make known what we don't understand. And the gospel is more than just Jesus died on the cross for our sins. That's a huge part of it. But the good news is there's more. That the gospel is a collective of many beautiful truths of God that when you see it in its full picture, that's when it stirs something in your heart and moves you. And don't settle for an incomplete picture of the gospel because all of it's too good to not know. Come on, somebody. And then we talked about in week two that, you know what, if you're going to, if we're going to inspire people to live in love like Jesus, then we got to be in love with Jesus. That the first to be handed this responsibility of making Jesus known in the world, they were infatuated with a handful of principles. They were in love with a person, and his name is Jesus, because they got a front row seat to his life and his teachings. And what they saw so wrecked them that they gave their lives for this thing that we are now getting to be a part of. And then in week three, we looked at Zacchaeus. He was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. But we talked about Zacchaeus made a transition that many didn't in his day, that he went from curious to committed. And at some point, you got, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're curious. Jesus loved to engage with curious people, but his engagement with your curiosity is to draw you from curiosity into commitment, truly understanding who he is. And that churches can't be so full of curious or casual Christians and it still accomplishes its mission. We gotta be committed to this thing. We gotta be all in. And then last week we talked about how, y'all, it's our turn. It's our turn. That in every generation, God has to raise up a remnant that are really bought in to carry this thing forward. And it's, it's our turn to make that thing happen. And so I plan this week now to pivot and to start talking about mission and vision and values and kind of the things that make up the DNA of who we are as Vintage Church. That was my plan. Mm -hmm. Last Sunday night, went to bed about 9.30, like I do most nights, and woke up about 12.30. And from 12.30 to about 2 a.m., me and God had a wrestling match. You ever had a night like that? Anybody? Where like you just you wake up from a dead sleep and there's things that you can tell the Holy Spirit is just putting on your mind and just wrestling with God about all kinds of things. Some of it was very personal stuff that He's pointing out in me that need to change. But in that, Matthew 23 just came to my mind. And I couldn't release it. So that's what we're gonna dive into today. And I would say it's going to be fun, but it probably ain't. If you don't know my story, uh, I accepted Jesus for myself when I was 14 years old. I grew up in the church. My parents are in the room today. My dad pastored churches for several decades. I was a pastor's kid. You know what they say about pastor's kids? We're all perfect angels. Uh, so I've been in the church my whole life, but there came a moment, like, for all of us, where you, you've got to decide for yourself if you're going to follow Jesus or not. Like, you, students, kids in the rooms, you don't get to heaven on anybody's coattails. You don't get to ride the faith of your parents into heaven. That just doesn't work like that. You've got to choose Jesus for yourself. Say amen, somebody. Like, you've, it's a personal decision that you have to make. I did that at 14. 
At 16, if you've never heard, this is when I preached my first sermon. I grew up in a very traditional church, y'all. This is our church. The churches I grew up in, it's probably like the churches that many of you grew up in. It didn't look anything like this. And, and, and so I grew up in the traditional church. And if you grew up in churches like I did, a couple times a year, you'd have Youth Sunday. And that's when the youth would kind of be in charge of the entire service. Y'all, anybody remember that? Say amen. Like, you remember those Sundays when they would, they would take up the offering and they would do all, they would pretty much just be in charge. That was a reckless idea. Can we just all be honest about that? 16 years old, and my dad said, Matt, I want you to preach on that Sunday. So 16 years old, I preached my very first sermon. It was like eight minutes long. And it was probably the worst sermon in the history of preaching. And that night, I kind of had a Samuel moment. And I felt like the Lord saying, this is what you're going to do for the rest of your life. And I said, no, I'm not. Because the time I was 16... I was very convinced about Jesus, but in a lot of ways, I hated the church because I had seen its ugly side. I'd watched my parents shed tears because of what Christian people had done to them, and I just did, I didn't want to be a preacher, and this is what I had in my mind. God, I'm going to prove to you you don't want me, and so for the next couple years, I went into a season of rebellion like no other time in my life. I decided I'm going to be a professional sinner instead of a professional preacher. And so I abandoned everything that, that I knew. And I was, I was doing things that like even, there's a, that very few people that are even still existing in this world even know about things that I'm deeply ashamed of. But you know what? I fooled a lot of people in my life. Probably said my mama. My mama's always, my mama could look at me and be like, you're lying. Anybody else got a mama like that? It's like there's something. But I would come to church, man, and I would say all the right things and I would do all the right things. I would go to my youth group every Sunday night and I would engage in conversation and I would, I would put on that show. I would put on that, 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 I would, I mean, I was, I, I, I wear Jordans because I was the Michael Jordan of playing Christian. I was the goat, man. Like, I could do it because I knew it. I've been in it my whole life. So I could speak the scriptures. I could say the things. Like, I knew how to very clearly and very well play the game of Christian. And so I would be in my youth group or I would be at church or I would be around certain people and I would act one way. But as soon as I would step out of that environment, everything would shift. But I remember sitting like with my parents or listening to my dad preach or going to spaces where the gospel was being presented and there is a conviction that would burn in me that would almost make me feel like I was going to explode because I, I knew that it wasn't right and I knew I was grieving the heart of God and I knew that I was doing things that were outside of what he wanted for me and you know what I, I, was, I was miserable and I was always living with this sense of paranoia that I was going to be out with that group of people that I was hanging out with and somebody was going to hear me say some things or catch me doing some things. And it was going to get back to my mom or my dad or, my, or the church people. And one day I would be cornered and caught. And let me tell you something. That's a miserable way to live. But even as I'm talking, there's people under the sound of my voice that are getting antsy. Because you're doing the same thing right now. Right now. The reason why what I'm saying is so uh, is, is hitting with you and resonating with your spirit is not because you've been there, but because you are there. And my prayer is today's the day that pretense falls off and something changes. Because if there's anything that grieves the heart of God, it's hypocrisy. If there's anything that we learn from Jesus' public ministry, what grieved him the most, what frustrated him the most, was the very kind of people I'm describing. And we have these encounters 
that Jesus has with these people. And look at me, y'all. He does not pull punches. He does not sugarcoat anything with these people. The way the, that Jesus interacts with sincere sinners versus hypocritical religious, religious people is a very stark contrast. See, there were some groups of people in the scripture that were supposed to be religious, that were, that were, were supposed to be righteous, that were given the opportunities and the resources to know God's word very well, but they, they were not stewards of it the way we've been called to be stewards of it. There were people like the Sadducees who had, again, exposure to truth, exposure to the word of God, but they misunderstood it and a misunderstanding of the word of God will always lead to a misapplication of the word of God. And he even tells them, he, he says to these Sadducees in the midst of a conversation about these things that their very problem they have is they don't understand scripture and they don't understand God. Look at Matthew, flip over a page or two to Matthew 22, verse 29. It says, Jesus replied, you are in error. Why? Because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. Look at me. They would have pushed back. They would have said, Wait, we don't know the scriptures. And then they would have been able to quote the Torah, portions of the Bible. They, he's like, when he's saying you don't know it, he's saying, no, you know it, but you don't know it. Y you know it, but you don't know it. Oh, you know the words on the page. You got the Bible study resume that's impressive. You got the memory verses because you grew up in Sunday school. So you know the word of God, but you don't know the word of God. There are a lot of people like that still sitting in churches in search of something, even this very morning. Come on. He says, see, here's the problem. Like, you don't really know. You don't know it. And you don't understand the power of God. Those are two things that will always strip you of the spiritual maturity and power that you need to walk this out with Jesus. But he came with the scribes and the Pharisees harder than anybody else. And Matthew 23 records this moment where Jesus, it's really Jesus' last public sermon. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but, but each of the gospel writers comes at the life of Jesus in a little bit different angle. And that's because God wanted to give us a nice, beautiful, holistic picture of who Jesus is. And so each of the gospel writers highlight different portions of his ministry so that we have this beautiful and, and as complete as God wanted us to have picture of the life and teachings of Jesus and what he did and what he said. But Matthew, above all the other writers, records the words of Jesus more than anybody. If you've got a red letter Bible in the book of Matthew, there's more red in that book than in any other book in your Bible because so much of Matthew focuses on Jesus' teaching. It's the whole Sermon on the Mount, or maybe it's not the whole Sermon on the Mount, we don't really know, but a huge portion of this sermon where Jesus comes at us with some serious truth that's relevant to this very day because it's the words of God and it does not expire. But Matthew 23 would be the last public sermon. This would be before he would go into the upper room with the 12 disciples, before he would have these private moments with those men that would be on the mountain and get the mission. And in his last public sermon, he addresses the fake, the insincere, the hypocritical. Go there with me. It's Matthew 23. We're going to start with verse 1. And we're going to read a lot of scripture, but again, it's okay. We in church. Matthew 23, verse 1 says, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do and everything that is done is for people to see. 
They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi for you have one teacher and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father for you have one father and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant for those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exhausted. Like Jesus is moving into this intense, in your face, coming at you, not any filter, hard as I can come, because this is my last chance to say to you what needs to be said, because I'm about to die, because y'all are determined to kill me. See, in Matthew 21, after Jesus is, he's, he's entered into Jerusalem, he's moving toward the last weeks of his life, and these people that he's talking to have already decided, we got to do something about this guy, because two things they had issue with, look at me. What he, what he said and with whom he sat. The two issues that these religious folk had, number one, was what he said, because he said things that they didn't like. He said things that were correcting their misunderstanding of Scripture, but it challenged their traditional view of it, therefore tra- challenging the traditional people that they admired, and that was really hard to swallow. So it was what he said, but it's also with whom he sat. Because he sat with people that righteous people don't sit with. He sat with sinners and tax collectors, prostitutes, swindlers, people of their day that were less than. Because, see, these Pharisees, not only were they religious, they were also kind of an aristocrat type mindset of, of socially they had a reputation to uphold. And Jesus says, look at them now. They, they sit in Moses' seat. Some of your translations, they sit in Moses' chair. The word there is the word saying, that's why we say, have you ever heard like a, the chair of a, a department at a school? It's that kind of word. It's this place of authority, this position of authority. He said, they have authority and they know the word, so listen to them. Do as they say, don't do as they do. Because they aren't willing to really follow through with what they even do. And they have an expectation for others that they will not align with themselves. They expect from others what they're not even willing to do themselves. And then it says they they have these phylacteries. They were these boxes that that people would wear, often on like their left arm or their left hand, or they'd strap them around their forehead, kind of follow that, you know, that scripture when it says, write it on your things and put it, that's that, it's a fulfillment of that scripture. So they would, they would literally write verses and put them in these nice, fancy things and have them attached to their person. It's amazing that these people knew the words on the page, but couldn't recognize the word in the flesh when he stood in front of them. They could recognize that they had the words on the page. They had the words on their hands. They even had the words on their heads, but they never got the word in their heart. So when the word in flesh was standing right in front of them, they couldn't recognize it. And Jesus is trying to rebuke them and warn his followers all in the same time. He's trying to get them to understand where they're missing things, where they're messing up and misstepping. And at the same time, he knows, like, they, you know, we've talked multiple times throughout this series of how odd it seems that Jesus chose who he chose to be the ones to entrust with this message. That's because of the ones that you thought he would have entrusted with couldn't be trusted. Of all the people you would have thought, because see, Jesus did not come to eliminate the Jewish religion, the Jewish faith, the Jewish system. Jesus was Jewish. I don't know if y'all know that, which is part of the reason why we need to be paying attention to some of the things that are happening in our world, like Israel, because God has declared something over that nation that is supposed to be for all eternity. And what's happening in that space matters to those of us who follow Jesus and believe in the word of God. And he says, y'all should be able to recognize me above anybody else because you've studied the prophecies. You've studied the scriptures. You've read all this stuff. And I'm walking it out and fulfilling every piece. And somehow, because it doesn't look like you thought it would, you're not able to get it. You're missing it. And it's right in front of you. And Jesus 
begins to point out some issues he sees in them. Let's keep reading. Oh, before, I get, before we move on, just so you don't understand, when Jesus says nobody's to call you rabbi, you're not supposed to call anybody father. Jesus is not saying you're not supposed to call your dad dad. What he's saying is you need to be careful who you elevate to places of authority in your lives because you will begin to match their lives. And if their lives don't line up with the word of God, you will be in a very problematic place. He's saying be careful whose authority you sit under because they can lead you in the wrong place and in the wrong direction. That's why, important, that's why it's important where we go to church and who we're listening to. And, I, and that's why I'm really scared that most, listen to me, most people's theology today is being shaped by YouTube, and that's scary. Because it will create an algorithm that will take you down a hole of error that is outside of the word of God before you even know it. So be careful what you're listening to, what you're letting into your mind, what you're letting into your brain, even when they may be quoting scripture. These people quoted scripture to every person they met, but they misunderstood it, misapplied it, and misguided the people. Told y'all it was going to be a fun day in church. Job to 13, verse 13. Matthew 23, 13. He says, woe to you, teachers of the law, scribes, and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. This don't fit with that nice little meek and mild Jesus that we think of sometimes, does it? He says, woe to you, scribes, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Now, that's a word that most of us are very familiar with now, especially when it comes to an association with the church, unfortunately, right? This wasn't a, a familiar phrase in this context, in this culture. See, this, this word hypocrite, it's, it's actually connected to Greek theater. It literally means play actor. So when they, when they heard this, I mean, Jesus was saying, you bunch of posers, All you are is a bunch of pretenders. You're play actors in masks. Literally, when the the culture heard this word, they would have thought of going to the theater, and there would be people that would play multiple roles at one time. So they would, you might not only have two or three actors, but they would have this bag of masks. And so they would put on the mask and then all of a sudden switch the mask in and out of character depending on what was happening in the play. Do you see now why Jesus chose that word? I'm at church. Let me put on my Christian mask. I'm at school. Let me put on my school mask. I'm at work. I'll put my work mask on. I'm a family. Put my family mask on. Because literally when, when he was talking about this, that's what they would do in Greek theater. You'd have two or three people up there playing, each person playing three or four different roles, all within the same production. And whenever they need to switch to a role, they just put out a new mask. And that's what, that's what he's saying these people are like. You're just a bunch of play actors. Swapping masks whenever it's convenient. I got really good at that. I got really good at that. Jesus is so frustrated and he's grieved. He says, woe to you, teachers of the law. And then look what he says in in verse 15. You go to win people and you make them twice a child of hell as you are. That's as strong a language as we ever hear Jesus use to anybody. Because he... They weren't making, they were making people like them, which was not a good thing. Because that's what you do. You, you, don't, you don't lead people to where you want them to be. You lead them basically to where you are. That's why parents, stop getting mad at the behavior that your kid is emulating that they saw in you. Got personal, didn't it? I'm sorry. No, I'm not. 
He says, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. He keeps dropping down to verse 23. He keeps going. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, like justice and mercy and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind gods. You strain out a gnat, but you swallow a camel. He said, the way that you are parsing out where you're obedient and where you're not is so inconsistent. He basically says, you tithe, you give, you you support what's happening, but then you neglect these other things that are important. And it shouldn't be an either or, it should be a both and. That you shouldn't be neglecting the things that you know God has called you to do. You're willing, and maybe you're willing to go throw your, your resources around because you like coming in with these big old stacks of things that everybody makes. Look, Dad, he's doing well for himself. He must, he must have had a good year. But you neglect justice and mercy and faithfulness. He calls them blind guides. You ever been led around by a blind person? Me neither, but it don't seem like it'd be fun. Right? And then he says, you strain out a gnat, but you swallow a camel. See, that's what they would do because they didn't want to, when they would drink things, bugs and different things would get in their drink. And because Jewish custom to, to swallow those things, to ingest those things would have been impure. He says, you, you'll take out a gnat, but you'll swallow a camel. So you throw out this little small thing, leaving the big thing in. It's like you haven't figured out how to understand all this stuff of what you leave in, what you choose to acknowledge, and what you blatantly ignore. Verse 25, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to be people as righteous. But on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. He says on the outside, everything looks great. You say all the right things and you do all the right things and you play the role really, really well. But there's something so broken and so distraught and so nasty on the inside of you. And until you get that stuff sorted out, until that interior gets settled and purified, nothing of any significance is ever going to change. May we never be found to be all appearance and no substance. May we never be found to be all appearance and no substance. Most of us grew up in the South. We grew up in the Bible Belt. It is inbred in us to play Christian. And it is not hard to figure out how to play that role because it is not foreign to us. And I know we often think about the churches that had those people and maybe want to believe we're not a church of those people. But sometimes we have to be willing to take a hard look at who we really are. And what needs to change? He says, you're all appearance and no substance. All appearance and no substance. Verse 29. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would have not taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. 
So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Go ahead then, complete what your ancestors started. Because see, Jesus knew they had already decided in their hearts they were going to try to kill him. And they convinced themselves that they were different when they were actually exactly the same. And then listen to verse 33. You snakes. You brood of vipers. How will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore, I'm sending you prophets and sages and teachers, and some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. So she says, I'm going to raise up a new generation of prophets because you... are not able to steward well what you've been entrusted with. There's a new group of people that I've been investing in for the last several years. And when I'm gone, I'm going to release them out into the world to share the message that you've missed. And you're going to do the same thing to them that you did to me and that you did everybody before me because you know the word on the page, but you have have not been able to recognize the word in the flesh who's standing right in front of you. Why? Why? Because you're just a bunch of fakes, a bunch of play actors. Sometimes I want to read this text kind of the way I read, read it today, almost like this angry tone. And it's easy to kind of look at Jesus' words and almost like project anger on him. But that word woe was not... W-O-E, not like, whoa, like, whoa. W-O-E, it was not, it was not a word of, of, of anger. It was really a term of grief. It was a term of grief. That what he's seeing in those people isn't eliciting, eliciting this anger from Jesus, but it's grieving his heart because that's, The posture that God has when he sees people wayward, it's not anger, it's grief because he knows the beauty of what you're missing by pretending to have something that's not real. And that's when everything changed for me. Like I went through this season when I was playing the role, putting on the mask. And the reason why I stayed longer than I had to is because I said, I can't come back because I know God's mad at me. And one day, something just switched. And it was like God said to me, I'm not mad. I'm heartbroken. I'm heartbroken. Because he knew the life I was living was destroying me from the inside out. The shame, the guilt, the paranoia, the fear was just rotting me. And he wasn't angry He was grieved. And his woe to you is the same it was to them. He's saying, woe to you. Because what you're getting versus what you're missing is so separate. And I want you to have what I desire to give. But I can't give you what you're pretending to already possess. And, and he finished his statement to these people with, with that same, same kind of call. Look at verse 37. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, how often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. Look, your house is left desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. See, Jesus says, I've tried. We've tried. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit have tried to gather you in, to correct these mistakes, to help you see these errors in hopes that we could gather you close to ourselves because we don't want you distant and separate. We want you close. We want you inside this family that Jesus is going to die to make possible for all of us. In 
And he's extending that same invitation to us today. It's time to take off the masks and throw them away. Who are you? Who are you really? Are you the you that we see here on Sunday? Is that the real you? Or did you walk in with a mask? And today is God saying, it's time to take off the mask because you don't have to wear it anymore. I'm not angry, I'm broken, I'm grieved. I'm calling you to myself to bring. See, Jesus never demanded perfection, but it's obvious to me that he detested inconsistency. That he was calling people to align their heart, their head, their habits, all into alignment with who God called them to be. And Peter, he reminds us, First Peter reminds us that we're called to be holy. The Bible says, be holy as I am holy. And holiness is a word that so often we have misunderstood and misrepresented. It says, but just as he called you to be holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. You know what holy means? I know we, we understand it means set apart. But what sets us apart? It's not just that we know the Bible or that we go to church. That's not what sets us apart from the world. What sets us apart from the world is the consistency with which we live because we deeply know Jesus, love Jesus, are empowered by his spirit to walk in alignment with our beliefs and our behavior. God's holiness is wholeness, a wholeness of belief and behavior, an alignment of all those things at one and walking in consistency with God. That's what he's calling us to. Do not just go through the motions and pretend. They knew the word. I mean, I thought about this this morning as I was sitting in my chair just praying and waiting to come and get ready to come to church. And if picking up your Bible doesn't result in laying down your life, then you've missed it. If picking up your Bible doesn't lead to laying down your life, you're a hypocrite. You're just playing. So who needs to take off the mask and shatter it and not put it back on again? I'm scared. I know it's going to be hard because when you because here's the thing when you take that mask off and confession starts to happen and you have to start going and talking to the people and telling them things and having hard conversations because see taking off the mask is it, it will lead to confession and repentance and accountability and things that are hard but it's worth it You bow your heads, close your eyes with me. I'm going to ask our prayer team, if they would move into position. We're going to worship before we get out of here. And around the room, there's going to be some people that if you need to talk to somebody, pray with somebody, they'll be around the room. If you want to come to the altar and, and just kneel and pray and talk to God, you, don't, you can just walk right by. The people that are up here, they're here if you need them. But across this room, there are people that if you just need to come and confess or talk or pray, there's individuals that are all around the front here that are ready to receive you. If you just need to sit in your seat and pray and talk to God and just confess some things, you know who you are. You know the woe that's coming from Jesus right now. There's some people in this room, you hear you saying, whoa. to you for showing up at that church every single week and pretending like everything's okay when you know it's not I'm going to pray we're going to sing and you respond however the Lord leads Father I pray that today you would just 
I have to pray, God, that you would bring conviction. Because sometimes that's what we need in this room, that we don't come here to be entertained or feel good. But God, nothing feels better than releasing guilt and shame. There's nothing more freeing than taking off the mask and being our true selves. And that's who you invite us to be so that you could start to heal and redeem and restore and do all the things that you so beautifully do in us. So God, I pray that today is not just another ending to another worship gathering at Venice Church. For those people who know they need to respond, but they're so scared already, they're thinking of reasons why they can't come talk to somebody, why they can't come up and pray, why they, they, they're in the middle of the row and they can't get out. Lord, just reduce, eliminate the excuses that stand in the way of your people responding to your voice. I mean, your spirit move in a mighty way right now in Jesus' name.